this second session of our interfaith series on breaking bread. And once again, we have the Treasure Coast's own God Squad with us. <laughs> Sheikh Mohammed, Sheikh Shafayat Mohammed from Al Hikmat Dawa Center in Pembroke Pines, outreach to Muslims and interfaith ministry. Pastor Jerry Gore from the Pentecostal Church of God in Christ in Stewart. Rabbi Matthew Durbin from obviously Frequent Bay, Ina. And Father Christian Anderson from St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Stewart. So God's God. We are coming together at a grievous time. Uh, it's a terrible moment for humanity, but just as the rabbi was saying, it's worth noting that we are coming together. Hey. Jews, Christians, Muslims, Black, White are breaking bread together at Special Day Ramp. out there that I hope you can take the message of this good news what we do at Breaking Bread to your friends, your extended family, and say this is how to do it. We can have dialogue. We can learn about one another. Amen. It is uh, terrible what is unfolding in the Middle East, but none of us up here are geopolitical strategists experts in the field of warfare or Middle East politics, so we won't be trying to address subjects that are already above our pay grade. <laughs> but I would like both Rabbi Durbin and Sheikh Shafayed to just say what is foremost on your hearts right now and how we can best pray for you and for your congregation, the people you represent. And then Father Christian will sweep all those prayer requests into one. Go ahead, Brett. I think my heart is going through a lot of emotions. <clears throat> like many of us, we have a lot of family live over the Middle East. Somebody once had asked me, and I think we've seen this all over social media. I think I may have mentioned this last week. Somebody says, do you have family in Israel? Yes. Seven million. And I think that that's really in my heart. Pray for stability. I pray for the hostages to be released, to go home, to be with their families. I pray for the innocent Palestinians caught in this conflict, where all they want is peace and to live their lives day to day. I pray for peace. That's, uh, I mean, that's just all. I can really say. Thank you. Shape, would you like to address that? So I would like to uh, join you, the Rabbi, in praying for peace. Uh, but before doing that, I thank God for blessing us to be here this afternoon to break bread together. It is really a pleasure. Uh, not many people throughout the world can do this. Not many people throughout the world can do this, come together in different countries, you know, I've been all over the world and I've seen that. Uh, we are really blessed uh, to be able to come together. And we must always thank God for all his favors and bounties that he has bestowed upon us. Uh, I, it is very sad what is happening. You hear on both sides what is happening on the media. Uh, we pray for all these innocent lives that have been lost. Last week again, someone asked me, what do you think is the solution? And I, I you know, as 
that Dashi said we are not the experts in that. But you know, from a from, from a religious point of view, I I always tell people, and I've said it in my sermon last week at the mosque, that this is not a Jewish Muslim fight. If you go back into the details of Judaism and Islam, we are the closest, the closest religions that exist in the world. We are the closest. We've got more commonalities in our beliefs. Even right here, we sit and we discuss food. I mean, Father will share, will, will bear with you because of the flexibility in Christianity. I mean, we still have more commonalities, Jews and Muslims, than even with Christians. Can you imagine that? I mean, in the orthodox days of Christianity, it may be the same. But in today's world, Muslims and Jews wow. in the whole world, we are the closest. And it's sad to know that you have this war fight going on, whether it may be political, whether it is with the militant groups and whatever. But innocent lives of Jews and Muslims have been lost. And this is sad and it should not happen. Uh, so we gotta pray, we gotta pray. Um, and uh, one of the solutions I have always recommended is it is a political situation. Politicians and world po political leaders need to get together. But I always recommend that they sit with religious leaders. Because if they don't sit with religious leaders who can go back into the scriptures to find a, a, a moderate path, a balanced way for peace and love, then politicians may have their own wills and fancies and may have their own ego in the matter. And that is what causes problems. I, you know, I went to Israel a couple of, 10 years ago on a peace mission, a peace mission in Jerusalem, Israel. And I told the rabbis and the priests and the religious leaders, the Muslim leaders, I said, if you would go into the Torah and the Bible and the Quran, and you look at the life of Abraham, and you look at the life of Jacob, and you look at the life of Joseph, we may be able to reflect on their lives and find solutions to the problem. Wasn't Joseph, wasn't he, you know, attacked by his own brothers? They would be of different mothers, but at the end of the day, his own brothers tried to kill him. How did he solve the problem? He solved it. He brought peace to the entire world and the entire family and all the people. I'm not going to the details. If we go back into the days of um, Esau and Jacob, they were big enemies. All over love, huh? love for their father or their father's love for them. You see what I'm saying? So whether it be land or it be father, or it be mother, or it be whoever it may be, jealousy to parents and wives or children, but they solved the problem. They solved the problem. Look at what happened with Moses and Pharaoh. How the, I mean, the Pharaoh who against the Israelites, the Pharaoh against Moses and the people of God and the Jews and everybody else. Moses solved the problem. He, 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 he responded, but at the end of the day, it was all a peaceful mission. And I mean, we in a modern intellectual world today, we are in a world of intelligence. We should not be having wars nowadays. We should not be having all these kind of military terrorist things. We are too sophisticated, too many universities, too many bright, educated people today. We should be able to solve this problem in a diplomatic, professional way without causing so many innocent lives. So I join with you and I join with the world in praying for, praying for peace. And I hope that we, this problem can be resolved early. Thank you. 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 All of that together in your own words. Yeah. Very easy then. Um, yeah. uh, this, we, we all mentioned now, uh, we talked about this is a celebration of all Abrahamic people. That's what unites us all. And we're all children of Abraham, children of the same God. And uh, we've mentioned. Uh, uh, separately, 
when we were having our Zoom before tonight, uh, and then you mentioned uh, in your sermon uh, Isaiah and, uh, and and the vision of Isaiah. So it, 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 I'm an Episcopal priest, and so we have a daily lectionary, and we have a set of readings that come out years ahead of time. And so our reading from the Hebrew Scripture of this last week was from Isaiah 25. Uh, and it was what the sermon was based on. And Isaiah gives us the vision of why we are here today. That despite uh, the crushing uh, expression of humanity that we're seeing right now, we are still, as people of faith, wild enough to believe in this vision that God has for us. And it comes from Isaiah. It says, This mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well matured wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well matured wine strained clear. So there's a great feast that happens upon the mountaintop of Zion, this mystical place. Well, we have that right now. <laughs> then earlier, Isaiah says, The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fattened together, and the little child shall lead them. And then earlier before that, and then Rabbi just referred to this. It says, he shall judge the between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Friends, we believe in that. As people of faith, you wouldn't be here. Don't lose hope of what God can do for his people. Even though we might seem like we're in the depths of hell, but as Wesley Churchill once said, when you're in hell, just keep going. Because <laughs> you'll get to heaven. Just get to it. Don't stop. So right now we lament. Lamentation is key. A lot of the, the scripture is lamentation. Lament. The tears, they're real. But don't lose hope, friends. So let's pray for hope. So God, of all children, help us to lament. Help us to weep. Your holy scripture is filled with it. May our tears add to healing. May our tears bring us wisdom. And I pray for your blessing over this space. And may us uh, see a glimmer of hope. That we see a glimmer of the vision of Isaiah's mountaintop here, of Zion. Where the lion does lay with the lamb where there is a great banquet, a feast for us all to feast upon together. Jews, Christians, Muslims, that we push back against uh, a vision that's being presented right now of humanity, that we say we reject that. Because we embrace your love, we embrace your healing, and God, we have no idea how to get there, but we are depending upon you to show us and all the leaders a way for that heaven to be revealed, a way for Zion to be revealed. Guide this time. Guide our hearts, and may the light of hope fill us all, Lord. May we not lose hope in the midst of the chaos and the darkness. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 Thank you. Last week we spoke about the various laws and regulations governing what foods can and cannot be eaten in the different faiths, and how food should be prepared. But today we're going to be talking about the special meals and festivals and fasts that are observed in each faith, and in which obviously food is a major component. So I'm turning to our God Squad for answers. <coughs> Rabbi Matthew first. The Jewish faith has a multitude of festivals in which food plays an important part. For the moment, let's just focus on Shabbat. We'll talk about the other festivals in a moment. Once a week, uh, beginning Friday evening, a few minutes before sunset, you celebrate Shabbat, which lasts until Saturday evening, roughly an hour after sundown. As I understand it, there are three festive meals eaten during that time. Could you tell us a little about Shabbat? Shabbat is... Uh the greatest gift that we have been given. We get it 52 times a year. 
And it's a time for us to really slow down and kind of see where we're at. Traditionally, there's Jews. Um, and it's, so, it, it, it's a difficult one to talk food on Shabbat because each, each have their own customs or their own, their own uh, delicacies. We're big on chicken. <laughs> We're big on chicken. We're also big on um, uh, uh, Jewish penicillin. It's called matzo ball soup. <laughs> we invented that. But I think I think for for, for some um, for some Jews, I think the meals themselves, Shabbat, the Shabbat meal, is really a time beyond food of family or friends coming together. It's to share a meal. Right? Much like we're doing today, breaking bread. Perhaps we engage in conversation or we, we, we talk, we just really enjoy each other's company. But with the meal itself, we would do our blessings first. So we would bless our candles, kind of ushering in Shabbat. They're always candles. Yes. And actually the reason that we have two candles, I don't know if I've used this before, <laughs> we have two candles because of the commandment. The commandment says that you shall remember the Sabbath day, and you shall guard or keep the Sabbath day. Right? That's why we have two candles. To remember and to keep, to observe. So we light our Shabbat candles. We bless the wine. Wine is a symbol of joy. And then the chal, the, the bread. Uh, there is a tradition on Shabbat for, we go back to Exodus and that part of the Torah, that God gave two loaves of bread on Shabbat. Manna came from the heavens. We got the two because we can't really work on Shabbat. And food's really important. God recognized that food is important to us. Uh, so we, we bless our food and we engage in, 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 in a meal together. Shabbat itself, Shabbat morning, we, we depending on, on, on how we observe Shabbat, some may come to synagogue, and some synagogues around the world may offer, after a Shabbat morning service, what we call like a kiddish lunch. It's predominantly dairy. Okay? And the reason predominantly dairy is because very uh, observant Jews, we can't cook, okay? Um, you can't light a fire on Shabbat. So therefore, dairy made it easy because you didn't have to use your oven. Um, I should also preface by saying, uh, as an addendum to last week, not all Jews keep the laws of Kashrut. I would say as a, as a rabbi, those laws of Kashrut are a personal choice to which we make. Being a good, deserving person, supporting community if we can, those are non-negotiable. That's what we strive for. So if we look at it from that perspective, it would be like a dairy, a dairy lunch. We also have, uh, in our tradition, the afternoon meal, because we Jews can't just deal with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we have to have breakfast, lunch, the afternoon uh, snack, the afternoon uh, nosh food, and then of course dinner. Uh, but it's actually called the third meal. Uh, and we have that third meal usually in the afternoon. Um, and then again, uh, when, when Shabbat goes out, you know, there's Motzei Shabbat, Motzei Shabbat, the going out of Shabbat, then we, uh, we do something different. But, but, but that's predominantly what it is. Many would have uh, a variety of different, different customs. I know when I was growing up, um, and I, I blessed my mother for this, I mean, it was matzo ball soup, it was, it was baked chicken, it was uh, uh, baked potatoes, uh, you know, some starch, some, some salad. I mean, it was just, it was really coming together, but it wasn't the food. It was, the food It was an aspect of it, but the majority of it was the togetherness and the ability to come together with friends and family uh, for really this moment. So it could um, be an encouragement to the interfaith as well. You could invite Gentiles. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Sheikh Mohammed, do Muslims observe anything like the Sabbath? I, I've read that Muslims don't believe in the Sabbath as a day of rest because their understanding of God is that he didn't need a day of rest. And so why for us to rest? But I don't know if that's accurate at all. So I 
interesting. That's interesting. So, um, we do believe in the Quran and in chapter 32 that God did create the universe and everything within in six days. But it, does, it did not specify what he did on the seventh day. <laughs> That's interesting. We don't have anything about him resting on the seventh day because we were also told in other chapters of the Quran that God does not sleep, does not rest, and is always there. However, with the Shabbat now, we do have a, a, a day that is called the, the Shabbat or the Sabbath day, which is called Juma in Arabic. The Juma now in Arabic refers to congregation when we come together. So I support. Uh, I suppose on the Sabbath day you have the, the people come together, the congregations come together. So Friday is our Shabbat day. That's when the congregations come together. That's when we pray and it's our main, most, just as Judaism, it's the holiest day of the week, Friday. As Saturday is your holiest day, Friday is our holiest day. Your Shabbat begins on Friday night, our Shabbat begins on Thursday night because we also, from the lunar cal calendar point of view, our day begins the night before. So we are, and we observe that Thursday night or that Shabbat night, which is the Thursday, just as Tuesday, Friday, everyone follow me, right? Saturday, Friday night, for us, Friday is the Thursday night. So that is a very holy night for us. So people get together, they pray, they do extra worship. Uh, yeah, in some traditions, in some countries, I mean, in America, I don't see them doing it much. Sorry. Yeah. In, <laughs> in America, I don't see Muslims doing it much, but in some other countries, they get together, they eat different food. Yeah, very interesting to hear what the rabbi said. They make different sweets, they eat, they share food for other people. And yes, they do share for other people, they invite other people, they bless their homes. Different cultures do different things, but I'm not saying that this is, uh, it is compulsory that you do this but it's recommended to do charitable deeds, do extra prayer. So different people may just read the Quran extra, <laughs> sit in, 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 in worship. As I said, they will give charity, go look for the poor, feed the poor, invite friends and relatives, bless their home, burn incense in the home. Some people wash the home. They do, so they are similar. allowed to work? Okay, now that point now, we are allowed to work, but when it's time for the prayer during the day, on the Shabbat day, you are not allowed to work. Very interesting. You see, because Islam does recognize that yes, these were the laws of Judaism, and then it came and gave that flexibility afterwards, you see. So just as the laws are in Judaism strong for, for the service, when it's time for that Shabbat service on the, our Friday Shabbat day, Ladies, uh, they, there's a concession. There is a concession where women are ex. Uh, they, they, they got a concession. Let me use the right word. Not that they exempt it, but they got a concession. That it's not mandatory for them. If because women may have different complications. Sometimes they say women may have monthly complication. They may be um, nursing the babies, they may be pregnant, these kind of things. Nothing, nothing else otherwise. Basic, basic nature thing. They may be occupied, they may be in pain, they may be delivering baby, whatever. So on those conditions, women are excused. It's not mandatory for them to go to the Sabbath. But do you know the law is for men, you gotta close your shops. Shut it down for that time, just like Jews, exactly. That time, it's no telephone, it's no cooking, it's nothing during that prayer time. You can do nothing during the time when you're supposed to pray. After that, you're allowed to go back to work, to go and yes, you could do otherwise. So our, that time is like the entire Shabbat day that Jews have to practice. So we are so very similar, so very. Once again. So, but once again, our Shabbat is the same 
laws. But again, the, the, remember the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he came after. So there is a modification, and Islam does teach us that when the Prophet, peace be upon him, before he received revelation, he used to lead all the laws between Judaism and Christianity. He used to take laws from Judaism and Christianity, and he used to rule by that. And as revelations came down, he modified accordingly. So the Shabbat is one of the things that is the same for that time, but modified that you can go back to work or you can do whatever. Okay. Anything else around that area? I think that's, that, that's what I can remember. Yeah. Thank you. This one will go Rabbi Matthew, a very few days ago, a few weeks ago, Jews finished celebrating high holy days. Uh, which began with Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, moved on to Yom Kippur, and ended with Sukkot and Sinchan Torah, which was tragically the day that Hamas launched its attack on Israel. Can you describe for us a bit the high holy days that you just celebrated, the feasting and the fasting? I know it's a, a lot to talk about, so just try to condense it if you can. <laughs> I will try. <laughs> I'll cut you off. I, I, I just wanted to also just preface um, uh, what Jacob said as well. Is, you know, it's, it's actually really interesting. Uh, in Israel, restaurants that are deemed not kosher have nothing to do with the food to which is being prepared. It's whether or not they're open on Shabbat. If you are open on Shabbat, you are not a kosher restaurant. It, majority of them uh, do close, um, but also Israel also recognizes that um, it is not just the Jewish people. There are Christians as well and uh, need to make uh, uh, the, some, as we say, Hebrews and Kesebs and money. Uh, but um, that's that's really the way it is. But if we, if we go to yeah, our ask a question. So in the Holy Land, if you have a restaurant or a store, that hires interfaith people. So you know how you hire, you don't care. Jews, Muslims, Christians. Making that work schedule can be a nightmare. Yes. Because everyone's got like just a myriad of holidays, and they all observe them. You got Shabbat, you got Sabbath, you got church. I mean, that would be a really tough gig to, yeah. to do the work schedule. But I will also say, you know what's also amazing is, is in, in this country and in the West, right, there's a popular phrase that we say when we work all the time, right? 24-7. You see it with um, convenience stores, right? We're open 24 seven. There are convenience stores in Israel that are called 24 six. <laughs> and and I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a joke. I mean, it, it, it's true, it says 24 slash six. We're open 24 hours, six days a week, except for Shabbat. Um, so let me, let me go with, 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 with the high holy days. So Rosh Hashanah itself is the seventh month in the Hebrew calendar. Uh, we are told in the Torah that the seventh month, the first day, shall be a cessation of work known as uh, the head of the new year, known as Rosh Hashanah. As Jews, we actually have multiple new years. Uh, Rosh Hashanah just happens to fall in the seventh month. One of them, one of the new years that we have is Passover, right? From slavery towards liberation. Um, but if we look at the, at, the, at the food surrounding around Rosh Hashanah, um, apples, which of course is still a strange one because apples don't grow in the Middle East. <laughs> but yet we eat them. Um, honey, to remind us of a sweet and healthy new year. There's also a tradition of eating, I swear to you I did not make this up, eating uh, fish, but eating the head of the fish. Again, I don't, I don't make it up. Can you eat it? Uh, thank you, Jewish world. Um, yes, and, and and actually, but part of the reason behind it is uh, the head of the fish is to bring good luck, it's to bring prosperity. It is uh, that understanding of also to start a new year. We also have, um, as I'm sure many of us have seen, um, you know, a challah or challah bread, right? Um, on Rosh Hashanah, the challah itself is round. They put in raisins. <laughs> so I'm not a huge fan of the raisin color. But we have it in a, it's, it's, it's circular. And that's to remind us of the cycle of a year, right? It's to remind us of the wholeness 
um, and in some way the piece. Um, there is there is much within uh, Rosh Hashanah, but really those iconic kind of foods are really the apples and honey that we dip. Uh, it is really the round challah. Uh, the uh, other foods, chicken, steak, whatever it may be, that's up to one's family and fish, but the, depended. Um, so if the apple is not going to the Middle East, so the garden of Eden is what? Eden. Like out in like uh, Kansas? Like where, where, where do we think the garden of Eden was? Because apparently there was an apple happening. They say that it was a quince. So oh, okay. let, me, let me address that one. Thank you. That, that was created by you guys. Oh. It was not created. It was not created. Because if you think about it, and, and just, just, just for this brief little tangent here, if you go back to the beginning of Genesis, Right? When Adam and Eve eat from the tree of knowledge, the first thing they do when they recognize their nakedness is they sew together fig leaves, not apple leaves. <laughs> fig leaves. Which means that the fruit that they ate may have been fig. It could have been the iconic pomegranate that grows in, in the land of Israel. Apples, the reason apple, because most of us can identify with it. Right? Um, but I, I, I don't want to go on that. No, that was more Pentecostal. So I blame it on Jerry. So that was very easy. Most of us are just a paleo. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah, that's it. Well, I mean, it may be like the apple of discord. It might be borrowed from Greek and Roman mythology. Absolutely. Even if you look at Sukkot, right, we have the etrog, that bubbly lemon, uh, which does not taste like a lemon, by the way. It is extremely bitter. Uh, that was never grown. That was never originated in Israel. It was originated in China. And it was imported to Israel. Now, of course, they grow them in Israel. but. Um, to go on, on some of the other foods, Yom Kippur makes it super easy. There is none. Yeah. <laughs> right. I saw this amazing image the other day where it said, this is my Yom Kippur meal that I'm having for lunch. And it was a plate with a fork and a knife, and that was it. We don't eat anything. Um, and part of that is we go back to our tradition, certainly with prophets, where um, Isaiah says, is this the fast that God requires of you? So we're supposed to deny ourselves um, earthly pleasures. Food is one thing, fasting is a way that we can really uh, you know, train our bodies in some way uh, to understand the severity and what we're going through when it comes to the high holy days. Um, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are likened to life cycle events. Okay, so Rosh Hashanah is likened to birth and Yom Kippur is likened to death. Um, but the foods associated with them are, are um, well, Yom Kippur makes it easy. Although Judaism does say that if at any point, from a medical perspective, that you need to eat, you're diabetic, or you need to eat, you must eat. Uh, we call it pikuach nefesh in Hebrew, to save a life is tantamount to anything that we do. You violate the laws of Shabbat. You violate the laws of, of, of ritual and of um, of festivals and holidays. Um, really, that's that's Tana. Sukkot was really the time we bring our first fruits, right? Um, we sit in Sukkot, our, our, our booths, um, and we just eat. Because if you've seen anything on Shtisl, or if you've seen any programming um, with Jews, the, the one thing that they do is eat. <laughs> Um, just go back a little bit to, to a brief situation. There was an instance about a week ago of an Israeli police officer who happened to shoot, shoot and kill five um, uh, Hamas terrorists uh, who were holding, holding his parents hostage in, the, in his house. So he had asked, the news reporter had asked, how did you do this? Of course, you see the Jewish mother goes, I just kept feeding him. I just kept feeding him. And when he got distracted, that's when my son came in with others to uh, alleviate the situation. But I remember watching this and thinking to myself, how iconic is this? I fed him, because that's really, and if we've ever been to Jewish homes before, the first thing that we do, we don't just say, oh, grab a seat. What can I get you? Here's some food, here's some food. But it is because food is intimate. Food is personal. And because we make food, there's something of how we make food with our hands that really is, 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 is an intimate and a holy act that we do. 
Um, but those, those, those are the three. The more interesting ones come with Passover time. We'll, we'll we, get to those. Judge Darcy, did we talk about before too, one time on the radio show, that Sukkot would be the time of Pentecost? I just want to bring in the Christian. Did, 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 is that no, that's Shavuot. 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 Okay, so that's that's next. That's next week. Yeah, we might get around. Let's, <laughs> Let's try to keep it Christian. <laughs> Shake shot my head. I think many people in, in the room here are familiar with the Islamic period known as Ramadan. We associate it with fasting, but I think people are less familiar with the iftar, the meal that ends each day of fasting and which is sometimes celebrated in a communal way including members of other faiths. Can you tell us about the iftar that occurs every night during the local Ramadan? So, um, Ramadan is like Yom Kippur. You fast one day, you gotta fast 29 or 30 days according to the Lunar calendar. You fast sunset to sunset, we fast from dawn to sunset. So we could go through the night without um, with eating. <laughs> so you see the difference. But again, the same purpose of the fasting is very similar. We fast because we believe uh, that by fasting, you know, while we have all the virtues of the food that the rabbi just told you, I mean, food, as we said last week, the way that man adds is to his stomach, right? <laughs> you give him good food and he just walk for it. So while God has created food, as uh, you know, in America, they start saying everything, every time you fell, you fall sick, the first thing they tell you to be tired. And here we're talking about eating. Because, I, you know, I have always had that problem with people. It's not about diet, I think. I mean, I'm not a medical doctor, but I think it's about diet from the wrong food. You need to eat the right food. So diet might mean stay away from certain things. And there are times you gotta just not eat at all. We know that based on whatever complication it is. But whether it's health or it's weight or lightweight or overweight, <laughs> if you eat the right food in the right time, like honey, olive oil, pomegranate, the Bible, the Torah, the scriptures speak about these biblical foods, and the Torah and the Bible. If we eat those foods in the right time, I mean, God created our body, and he also created the, the proper food for us. It's unfortunate that we eat a lot of processed food. Instead of eating the chicken in the backyard, I'm coming to the fasting, but I don't want to But come to the iftar. Yeah, the iftar meal. And because that, this will answer my question with the iftar meal. Like, even chicken, we eat a lot of processed chicken. I remember one, one friend told me, he said, the processed white chicken that you eat around, is very good because it has nothing in it, it can't harm you. <laughs> and if you eat the birds from your backyard, what I don't know what you call it, you know, the regular chicken? The farmyard grow chicken. The farmyard chicken. I mean, come on, when you talk about chicken soup, that's the soup you eat that you get the healthy things from. What, what do you call it nowadays? What do we call this? Um, awesome. No, everything is, is, is now going organic. organic. This is my point, fruits, organic beans. So God created the human body, and just as you have food as a major thing Rabbi was speaking about in Judaism, we have the same thing in Islam. God created honey, created, you know, once the prophet peace be upon him, there was some complication, you know, in Islam, I mean, I know we don't have that topic down the line, but maybe we could contemplate it. You know, he had many wives, and one of the wives told him, I do not want you to drink honey because one of his wife gave him honey. When he came by the next wife, she heard the other wife gave him honey. She said, no, I don't want to drink honey. He said, okay, I'm not gonna have honey again. And God reprimanded him. He said, I establish honey. Honey is good for you. You don't have to let a human being stop you from whatever it is. So but God anyway, the wife. So I'm trying, yeah, I'm trying to say how much God established food with a purpose. But now when it comes, so that is it. We all know that that's why every different religious festival has got different types of food. But it has been designed for our health to be healthy and better. Now, in Ramadan, we are taught, and I suppose the same thing, that now you starve your body from food for that period of time. Because when your body, when, when, when your body goes through that process of not eating and you go through hunger, you think more. 
You, you concentrate more. You contemplate more. You worship more. And you can have a little more connection with God. It's not my whole life. That's why I gave the virtues of food before. You know what I'm saying? I don't want anyone question it. You can regulate it. It's a time. You got to. It, it helps you spiritually to concentrate. You know, if you notice people, you, have you, when you fly in an aircraft, have you noticed what happens? As soon as you feed the people, what's the next thing? They all asleep. <laughs> they all asleep. They're like knocked out. It's because when you eat too much, you fall asleep. And even if you don't eat too much, you just sit as soon as you eat on a sofa. You don't get up. Don't get up. You see the next thing, it goes away. News or no news. You get up, you walk for 40 footsteps. As soon as you eat, you feel healthier. You digest your stomach. Your body, your body gets balanced and you're back to normal. Let's check it out. I don't need to go through these nine years. It's not a school we're in, but this, these are the things. So fasting now gives us that benefit. So it's, it's a spiritual reason to keep the body. So it's spiritual it's nutrition. spiritual nutrition to keep the body healthier because the more you eat is the less you pray. So you get more time. That's what that's the whole thing about it. The breaking of the fast in the evening, you are, you are recommended, the Prophet peace be upon him, we were taught that you break fast with the date. The date. You know the dates? Oh, because wow. that is not yeah. a day like go to a movie with No, no, no. Oh no. no, yes, no. no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good date anyhow. <laughs> so whenever I go to a movie with a girl, don't give her chocolate, give her dates. Oh. Okay. Happy. Anyhow, that's a kid. I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't know. You guys pick that up? Oh, come on. On Valentine's, you can give her a day. Add more nutrients than chocolate. <laughs> anyway, so, Rabbi's laughing. Come on. Now. I, I think, I'm I think the, dates, the dates are very big in Israel and for Jews and Muslims. Dates is a very, very, very powerful. It's a powerful food. You can survive on that because yeah. of the nutrients you've got in it. So now when you break fast, we are recommended to break fast with that. And basic water. Now, unfortunately, Yes, if you go to a community breaking fast. So there are community breaking fasts, like how people get together to, to break fast or young people and other days. So when the communities get together, they make it more a festival. So they cook all the wrong foods. They are frying this, they are baking this. So all the health that you develop during the day, you lose it in the evening, <laughs> unfortunately. People eat, do you know, statistics have proven that Muslims eat more food in Ramadan than out of Ramadan. Oh, <laughs> they gain weight. They gain weight in Ramadan because they eat so much in the morning at dawn, four, five o'clock. Twice or thrice enough for the day. Normally during a regular day, it's a cup of coffee and they're gone. In the evening, you know, light or lunch. But in Ramadan, they eat three times more all day, all night. So they, which which really violates the purpose. Well, but let me let me just move on a little bit because I've got a lot to cover yeah. here. Ramadan ends with one of your major feasts, not the biggest one, which we'll get to, but the King House Fitter. Yes. Can you just explain a bit about that? So every day you break fast with your date and basic food. Then at the end of the entire month, when the month comes to an end, you have a, a, a an entire day of feast. So every day you've got a feast in the evening, which should be moderate enough to keep you going for the month. But as you ask, the Eid al Fitr, it's the festival of the breaking of the fast. So now it's the all day you can eat, but not again overeat. You eat the right food, you eat sweets. You, the Prophet peace be upon him, we were taught that before he went to the church, to the mosque on the, on the day of Eid, he would have sweets before. So it's a day of eating, inviting friends, inviting family, go to visit friends and so family. So it's interfaith as well. It's very good. You are recommended to do that. You gotta share with the poor. You gotta give sadaqah. You say sadaqah. You got before you pray on that day, that eat or fit, that feast day. You gotta feed the poor or give money to the poor so they can enjoy that day. The rich alone should not enjoy that day. That's part of the law. It says that until you don't do that, all the blessings of your fast remain hanging. Mm. You've got to feed the poor before you celebrate your, your, your day. Beautiful. Very important. And one more thing on that I wanted to share before. And we're going to come to the, the, the Abrahamic uh, Yes, family. absolutely. That's but before that, the, the Yom Kippur in Islam, on, that's the, the tenth of your first month, right? 
We also fast on the 10th of the first month. I wanted to say that it's called Ashura. We have a fast that other than the obligatory fast of Ramadan. Ashura. Yes, Ashura. So Ashura means comes from the Arabic word Ashara 10. So the first month of the Islamic calendar, we fast. The first month of the Jewish calendar, you fast. And we fast for the same reason that Yom Kippur. It's the same fast we got, it, not even similar. Well, this is just a love thing. And this is interesting. <laughs> first, the, the ten, first 10 days, I mean the 10 days, the 10th day of the first month, we fast. Just like Yom so Kippur. Much and it's all about Moses and the people crossing the sea. We'll get to those. All the religious things. We'll get to those. One festival that all three Abrahamic religions recognize in one way or another is Passover. All three faiths mention Israel's captivity in Egypt and how Moses, God's chosen prophet, eventually led his people to freedom, as recounted in the book of Exodus. Judaism celebrates this event with the meal of the cedar, which recalls Israel's deliverance, the way the angel of death literally passed over the homes of the Israelites who had smeared the lintels of their doorposts with the blood of the lamb. Rabbi Matthew, I realize, and I don't want you to go into all the details of the cedar, <laughs> but could you give us kind of a sketch of the cedar meal and the foods that are consumed in their symbolic meaning? So, <clears throat> I know it's so hard to be brief. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take it from what we would call an Ashkenazi perspective, um, and I do this for for a good reason. I, I'll, I'll actually explain both um, traditions. The Ashkenazi is from the Jews who late century to Eastern Europe. Um, Passover and the Seder itself. Seder comes from the Hebrew root um, Samach Balibresh, which means story. Right? Um, Seder means order. We have in our sanctuary cedarim, prayer books. It's an order of our prayers. So with the Passover Seder, there are a table of contents, which are 15 steps that we have in order to do the Seder itself. But some of the foods that you would see on the plate, on what we call the Seder plate, would be, you would see something like parsley, okay? Parsley or celery, radicchio, something of a, a green of nature, because it is a spring harvest. Remind us, right? You also see on the table, uh, salt water. The tears of the Israelites. We dip them twice. My favorite part of Passover, I'm, I'm a huge fan of parsley. We also have what we call chorosa, which is like chopped apple, dates, nuts, I get it, the apples, <laughs> and the dates, and the dates. Um, and we mix it, it's almost like the brick and mortar. So a lot of it is very symbolic. We have an egg, symbolic of life, and the cycle. We have the shank bone, a symbol of the lamb. The lamb is really interesting and very curious because many Jews don't eat lamb on Passover. We eat, of course, the world's most Jewish food, chicken. So why not lamb? Lamb was an Egyptian god. He was a coup um, of some sort of nature. His depiction was a ram. So when the Israelites have the lamb, the lamb's blood put on the doorposts of their house, so God passes over, it is the ultimate apostasy to the Egyptians. That's why we have the lamb. There are many foods that we are not supposed to eat. We're not supposed to eat anything that is leavened. Right? No pasta. Sorry, That's pasta. why you have the matzah. Yes, why we have matzah. And actually, if you take it from the ingredients to baking, it must be done within 18 minutes. Anything longer than 18 minutes, you've got bread. Okay. So actually, we cannot have anything that rises, right? There's no past this. Because the Jews had to leave quickly. Yes, right. And the tradition is we don't eat um, 
legumes, we don't eat peanut butter, we don't eat, um, right? It, it, it's like the one time of the year where I spend seven days reading through ingredients of, can't have the corn syrup, can't have that, right? Because of Eastern European origin. However, we also have what we call Sephardic Jewry. Sephardic Jewry are the Jews who lay descendantry from Spain, North Africa, and the Middle East. Okay? Their main staple is rice, is legumes. So that's what they eat on Passover. Ashkenazi Jews, the most, besides the chicken, the most iconic food that is on your table are potatoes. Why potatoes? It's grown in Eastern Europe. It's their staple. If I remove the rice from the Sephardic diet, there's very little to eat. I remove the potato from the Ashkenazi diet, there's very little to eat. My favorite, my favorite story, when I was in rabbinical school, having to go to, uh, I was with a colleague of mine, and we're sitting there in this Chinese restaurant because we figured Chinese is relatively safe uh, for Passover, as long as I don't eat rice. So I'm sitting there and my colleague is, I mean, eating rice like it's the end of the world. And they go, what are you doing? It's Passover. And he goes, oh, I'm Sephardic. I go, really? Aren't you like fourth generation Minsk? He's from Belarus. He's Belarusian. And he goes, well, I like to embrace my entire faith. But there is the, you know, the foods between Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews are very different, especially around Passover. I um, just want to share with you some of the different traditions in some way. There is uh, the Jews of Gibraltar. I just There's, want to uh, indicate that this is the way Rabbi Matthew does drink. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to see it when it's, it's a lengthy it's discussion. Yeah. So the Jews of Gibraltar uh, would actually take sand from the shore and they would mix it into harosa, which is the apples, the nuts, the, the bricks and the mortars. And then they would eat it. Now we think that that's um, unappetizing and gross, but for them, it's the grittiness. It's the grittiness of slavery, that they taste, they feel it. There are Jews of Ethiopia or East African descent where they will take their earthenware and they will shatter it on the floor as a break. So that it is a break, a clear break from one state to another. I mean, it is a constant. There's a lot of symbolic imagery and a lot of spirituality that's been put into it. But that's, that's it in a very- In a nutshell. Very big nutshell. Father Christian. Christians no longer celebrate the Passover as such but it's believed that Jesus' last meal with his disciples, the Last Supper, took place at the time of the Passover, uh, that it was in fact the Savior. And yet it was he, as Christians believe, who actually became the sacrificial lamb by whose blood Christians are saved. At the time of that meal, he instituted what Christians now call the Holy Communion or Eucharist, can you describe this holy meal that Jesus himself instituted and what it means to Christians and how often we celebrate now? Well, I'll be brief because... Uh, <laughs> you don't have to. Because uh, I do want to hear from Pastor Gore on this because it is uh, good to have two Christian, Christian pastors up here. As Episcopalians, we have a take on uh, the Holy Eucharist, the communion. Uh, it is something that we at least have once a week, if not more. So at St. Mary's, we have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Sunday. If you call us, we'll come to your house and bring it to you as well. Uh, and so it is a very Eucharistic-focused uh, denomination. Uh, within the last 30 years, it's been a big focus on that. Um, and so the Eucharist itself, the communion, everything we do in the service comes to this moment at the altar. Uh, and, and so Isaiah, we would take that reference of the Holy Meal, what is that holy meal? For us, it's, 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 it's Jesus Christ who offered himself as the, uh, the, the Lamb of God. And so the prophet John the Baptist, when he shows up on the scene, he's the one who tells everyone, look, that's the Lamb of God. That guy, he, he takes away the sins of the world. 
So this that lamb reference, so Jesus, again, born a Jew, circumcised a Jew, died a Jew, did not start a new religion. He's a Jew. Um, so as, as Christians, uh, that term didn't come to much later. I just want to re reaffirm that. So I was listening to Catholic radio this morning. They were talking about like Christian converts um, from Judaism. No, they, the original Jews following Jesus were Jews really for Jesus. Uh, and, and so all that, all that comes along with this following of Jesus saying, okay, we believe this guy is the Messiah. So Jesus then on the night before he dies, does offer the supper and says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And he will offer himself and say, uh, my, my, my body and, and my blood for you to, to reference. He makes that connection to it. So it becomes the new covenant. Jesus becomes, there's a new covenant that's made with the people. There's a, a, a new Passover that is made uh, for the people, for those who follow Jesus from this point forward. So like the blood being put over the doorpost, now there's one final sacrifice that has been made. Because on the day of Passover, as Christians we would believe, now the lamb was sacrificed upon the cross. So this is the meaning of the cross. So that, that's the sacrificial lamb who gets raised up is on the cross, and there's no more sacrifice needed. And so therefore, this why we crazy Christians that Rabbi and I razz each other about is that what well, he razzed me about is that we you know you, you throw your sins upon the lamb, but if you do the same thing you would do in a temple, you place your sins upon the lamb or the goat, the scapegoat, and then that goat is killed. So for us, it's the same way that you're putting now upon the Messiah, uh, this lamb. So every time we have the sacred meal and everything we do in the service prepares us, there's certain things we have to do before we receive the holy sacrament. We can't just walk in and take the sacraments. Okay, so you, if you do that again next Sunday, I'm not going to give it to you, all right? You got to come in earlier, and then you got 20 things to do, all right? Um, so you, you, there's all these things, and one of them is your confession of sin. You got to confess your sins to cleanse the palate, your soul to be ready. Uh, and the scripture says, before you have the sacred meal, come to the altar, make sure you make peace with your friends. Um, so if I have beef with any of you, um, I would need to go to Joni Hoard and say, Joni, I'm sorry, forgive me. Uh, let me cleanse my palate before I go and receive the holy meal of God. Um, and so that is uh, our sacred meal. Now, that we believe in something called the holy mystery. So Catholics was called transubstantiation. There's actually a, trans, a transfer that happens with this bread and wine. Uh, Lutherans would go with something called consubstantiation. I'm not going to go into all this because Darcy is going to take a hook and pull me off the stage. Uh, Anglicans, that's, that's me. We're like right in the middle. It's a, it's a holy mystery. Something's going on there. Something's going on there. Uh, but I am curious. Uh, yeah, is that, a, is that cool to check in with Absolutely. Pastor Gore about your take on this? Because I'm a Protestant. Some people call me Catholic. I'm Protestant, and you are Pentecostal. Pentecostal. So I also love your your brevity, by the way. Yeah. Which I'm grateful that my brevity, but thank you. It wasn't bad for me. I think it's, it's contagious. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pastor. Set it straight, Gore. Praise God. Amen. 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 Uh, yeah, we do the, we call it Holy Communion. Uh, the night when Jesus took his disciples and went to the upper room and they, they broke bread together. And uh, he was betrayed at their part. But we have a Holy Communion on the uh, first Sunday of every month. If you come to visit, you're going to be there a while. As we go through this uh, ritual with the white sheet and the white garments and the outfit that we wear, the white. Uh, I may work, I may go just like I am, but I put on a white robe for that Sunday. And so, yeah, we believe in that. Is, uh, that was the, uh, uh, the passing. Okay, so on, uh, and, and that's another thing that I read personally a confession. An outline of a confession. Now, you can confess whatever you want, whatever you bother you, whatever you're going through. Uh, whatever you did wrong, you confess it to God at, at the altar at that point in time of the day. So when you leave there, you don't take it with you. And this, we call that a new life. Starting all over again. Almost like uh, Father Christian says, if I have an altar against my brother, I would not take it. I would go get my brother, bring him to the altar, and be reconciled, and then he would take it because that's the newness of doing So that's a very holy uh, ceremony. Uh, uh, not just in the Pentecostal 
for all of my customers, all cultures, the AME, the Baptist, all of them. They do the same thing on the first uh, uh, on the first Sunday, and we serve and we worship on the first Sunday of the week, not the seventh day, but we worship on the day that we felt like Jesus rose from the grave. Okay, so now when, when Jesus bowed down to God's altar to be hung upon the cross, we believe that he was a perfect lamb. The reason why there was never a prophet or any disciple, anyone that could go through the trials and tribulations and the temptations and, and was able to remain pure. And he made it all the way to the cross. Now, so he was the perfect sacrificial he was lamb. The perfect without a blemish. Without a blemish, except at the end, when they felt like he had, he had not died, they went back and they pierced him, and blood and water came out of his side. We sang a song that we will wash, if you wash away our sins with the blood of the Lamb. We believe in that. We believe also when we had the transition and the graves opened up and they began to walk into Jerusalem. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. And John said that he baptized them with water, but there was one coming after him that will baptize you with the fire of the Holy Spirit. The fire of the Holy Spirit burned within and burned outward. And the reason for that is like circumcision. It's to cleanse the hate and the malice from around your heart. And that spirit, you know, what I like about that, if you have doubt about your profession and things like that, and you still feel the fire of the Holy Spirit, he would not dwell in anything unclean. He would not do that. So we felt like he was the perfect sacrifice. And once you come in the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, and like the fasting, fasting is very important because you have a, you need to have a purpose for fasting. You need to have a purpose. Are you saying, Pastor Gore, that you precede the uh, taking of the communion with a fast? I need to kind of compress your answer. Okay, yeah, with the, no, the communion, you need to confess. You need to confess before you take the communion. And fast, oh, I, I misunderstood you. You were okay. saying confession. I thought you were saying fasting. No, 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 no fasting. Okay. But what I was saying, the sheep was saying about, uh, we're talking about uh, fasting. Fasting. Fasting is when you want to answer something from God. Yeah. Okay. I won't preach anymore. I won't eat until I preach because then all the energy goes towards the spirit. So you're getting just what the shape said, that kind of spiritual nutrition that you need to preach. We do have one more major uh, festival that we need to talk about, and we don't have the time to talk about it all. Can I just make, just, just for clarification purposes, um, just so that we're clear, um, and again, Christian, you can, uh, Father Anderson, you probably, and, and Pastor Gore speak this better than I can, but the, the Last Supper in and of itself uh, could have been a festive meal, which we know. Um, however, the Passover Seder did not originate until 300 years after Jesus' death. It's actually created by the rabbis um, post 300. So the rabbis come together to, uh, like he, to tell the story of the Exodus. Um, so the actual Seder does not uh, did not originate until uh, about 300 years after Jesus' death. Um, Good point. So yeah, I just didn't want. Uh, Thank you. That's episode three of the podcast. Yeah. Thank you. That's a very good clarification that I was unaware of. Uh, we want to talk about the Eid al-Adha, which is absolutely critical, and it ties together the three faiths in in other ways. But we're on the cusp of 1.30. So I think uh, what I'll do is tantalize you for next week to come back and hear about a high holy day that uh, everyone will address. And I think we'll keep the same format. We'll also be talking at that time about cultural change, how these traditions and the orthodoxy that uh, was laid down has been modified over time, for better or for worse. But I thank you so much 
for coming out today and being so patient and quiet uh, for all of us so everybody could hear. Rabbi Matt. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity for all of us here to uh, acknowledge and to really express our gratitude, Darcy, to you. Absolutely. I, I, I cannot express to you how much thought and how much work that Darcy has put into this to be able to have it go as seamless as we've been able to do it. And I do want to thank my colleagues, Pastor Gore, Shake, my priest. <laughs> but really, I also want to be able to thank all of you. It is, there is a thirst and there is a hunger uh, for what we are doing. And um, one last prayer for the world. Given the situation that we know is very painful, very difficult, I have to be honest with you. This gives me great hope. I don't know who's close on the sound. Oh God, let the world see what we are doing. Jews, Muslims, Christians, coming together of deep faith and longing that all of us live in peace and harmony. Oh God, let us always be mindful and remember, although there are differences in what we believe, there's a lot of commonality in the humanity that we share with one another. May you always be with us now and always. May we always strive for justice and peace. Shalom Aleichem. Salam Aleichem. May peace be upon all of us.